I actually had my, oh, we're live now. Um, we'll wait, give a few minutes for people to come in here. I actually had one of my first overnight uh, trip. I usually go to like Paso or other parts of the Central Coast with some frequency. And uh, I had my first overnight trip this week up at the Paso, which was nice to get out. Um, although it's still all kind of like shaking hands is not as weird. You know, it's all weird. <laughs> yeah. I'm bowing. I do. I'm in, like I'm in Japan. I'm bound to everybody. You're bowing. That's good. Yeah. Kinichiwa. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So it looks like we're live. Um, welcome to those of you who are filing in here. Uh, as many of you of our repeat uh, guests uh, know, this is the Santa Rita Hills Wine Alliance, our uh, kind of Santa Rita Hills to You series of wine tastings with uh, winemakers who work with Santa Rita Hills fruit and uh, some of whom own vineyards and wineries here. Today we have um, Tyler Thomas from Deerberg uh, Vineyard and Star Lane. So they own uh, Drum Canyon Vineyard specifically as their Santa Rita Hills property. And we're also joined by uh, the one and only Paul Lotto, uh, who works with a lot of vineyards around Santa Barbara County and beyond, uh, and uh, is going to pour a couple of his wines today, including one of his Drum Canyon Vineyard wines. So before we dive into them, let's um, do a couple little uh administrative thing so uh if you haven't followed us before um we've been doing this since looks like june 23rd we started this series and it was weekly uh for a number of months there and then we've switched now to bi-weekly usually on tuesdays but today uh because everyone's getting so busy we had to switch to a wednesday schedule uh, we've had fiddlehead and Camines to dreams we've had marjoram and santa barbara winery slash the fawn we've had dragonette liquid farm temperance buscador uh brewer clifton ken brown we did on um on july 28th we had a face Yega showcase where rick longoria uh, adam tolmack of ojai vineyard and billy Wathen of fox and um you know all poured a couple uh vintages from face Yega vineyard that they all share the fruit from uh we had a really special the last one we did was a really special event uh, on august 11th where we presented richard sanford with a uh, vintner of the year uh, award. Well, I should say his wife and daughter presented him with the Vintner of the Year Award um, as a bunch of us uh, kind of applauded his efforts. And um, there were even some tears. It was a pretty meaningful thing as far as that goes. Uh, for uh oh, we lost, we lost Matt. It seems like we did. So well, Paul, you're going to take, take it away now, okay, right? <laughs> we take we take over the show, man. You and I. I haven't done that one yet. Uh, that's when you click the wrong button on your screen. Um, anyway, so, so fast. that was wonderful. It was like it was pretty movie. quick. <laughs> so coming up, we have uh, after today's series, we have uh, or today's show on September eighth, we have Flying Goat and uh, Sea Grape uh, on September eighth. September twenty second, we have. Uh, Joey Gamer uh, from Transcendence and Mark Horvath, Horvath from Crawford Family. They, they were uh, Kenneth Crawford, which was kind of a more Syrah-focused brand way back in the day and then started their own brand. So that should be kind of some fun reminiscing there. And October 6th is the is the one, the only one we have scheduled beyond that, which is um, we have the Hitching Post uh, boys uh, or men, Frank Ostini and Gray Hartley. And then from Pally Wine Co., we have Aaron Walker, who's the winemaker and is also the son-in-law of Gray Hartley. So that'll be a fun family episode. Um, and then the other thing that the Santa Rita Hills Wine Alliance wanted me to, to plug uh, on today's call was um, they have their passport event coming up uh, September 1st to 15th. So it's not exactly like it is usually, but you for 30 bucks, you can buy a passport and um, go visit various tasting rooms that are members of the Alliance. Um, there's also some special wine deals you can do and taste from home. If you don't want to come out. Um, so it's a whole, uh, an attempt to you know, again, bring the, the Santa Rita Hills to you uh, and all that. So that's uh, what we got. And without further ado, let's dive in here uh, with Paul Lotto and, and Tyler Thomas. Um, you know, I think there's if there's a through line to these guys, other than the fact that we're both going to take they're going to taste Drum Canyon Vineyard from both of them. Um, it's that they they came uh, to some extent from outside of the area after having established careers uh, for Paul Lotto. He was kind of a very renowned uh, sommelier and, and new wines from really across the globe. Uh, and then Tyler, although some of his earliest days were here in Santa Barbara County, um, working with Fiddlehead when he was when he was quite young, you know, that he then had established a career and a name for himself up in uh, the North Coast in Sonoma and um, and then came down 
uh, what was like 2012 you came down, Tyler, 2013? 2013, yeah. 2013. So he then has some perspective on how this region was looked at up on the North Coast, which I always think is interesting. Uh, and they can both talk a lot about how this, this region has grown in um, respect and, and prominence over the years. So first, let's go to Paul. Paul, tell us a little bit about your background uh, and um, how you were a sommelier and then why, of all the regions in the world, you decided to come to Santa Barbara County to uh, stake your claim. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Once, once more, one more time. Um, uh, yes, it was. Uh, it was 18 years ago. After September 11, I was really reconsidering my life, and we know what happened back then. I think, with all the tragic things that happened at that time, uh, many of us who had to draw some lessons and and reflected on you know what we do who we are and what we want to do uh i lost my job of course in a high-end restaurant that was uh, catering to a lot of tourism and and uh overnight and uh, i took some time off and uh, i decided that hey you know i want to pursue my dream of winemaking i've been talking about this to my many of my friends for like at least uh, four or five years and they, most of them said, you know what, well, you're such a dreamer. You don't, uh, you know, you're somebody you don't understand anything about winemaking. Uh, you know, you if you have Canadian passport, you live in Canada. Uh, even though, for those of you who don't know, I'm originally from Poland. So this is not a Quebecois accent that you can <laughs> hear here, uh, but my own. Uh, and... Uh, uh, so they said, don't be such a dreamer. You, 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 you're great with wine. You love to cook. Why don't you open a restaurant in Toronto? And I said, well, I love restaurants, but I, I really have this calling for being closer to, to the land and uh, working with my hands and my creativity. And I just said, you know, I want to uh, make wines rather than interpret someone else's wine. Uh, I just, I was 34 years old. I needed that change. I just felt so, um, I did, rec I did consider two other places uh, in the world. New Zealand was one and, and Burgundy was the second. And uh, from perspective now, uh, my goodness, you know, uh, I made the right decision. I never, with all the challenges and, and, and uh, it's not a, you know easy road for any of us winemakers and especially if you're uh, try to own your own brand. But, uh, the, you know, I lo always love the wines of Santa Barbara and when I came here for the first time in 96, hang out with Jim Clendenin and Bob Lindquist and, uh, you know, Gray Hartley and all those guys, I, I noticed that people are very special here as well. Uh, so um, even though I hesitated a little bit because I had this love for Burgundy and, and so on, I said, no, 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 no. All the, all, all the roads were leading to Santa Barbara. So that's what I chose and I never regretted it for one day. Uh, right. You know, when start, did the Santa when did the Santa Rita Hills land on your your map then? You know, I, I was a little bit of a Santa Santa Maria boy, so to speak. I was I was highly conditioned by Jim Clendenin at that time, uh, who still is a friend and a guru. But uh, I, now I don't believe everything he is saying. You know, <laughs> back then I did. Uh, no, Jim Jim loves Santa Rita Hills, but <clears throat> he was uh, he was you know making wines from both. Both areas, Sanford and, and Benedict, was one of his original vineyards, I, I believe. But, but anyway, uh, I started with Gold Coast Vineyard, which we're still using uh, uh, right now uh, in Santa Maria and Solomon Hills later on, which we still have. Uh, but I think in actually this is a good story. I remember this very vividly. Uh, it was just a sideways time. And I and I wanted to make wine from Santa Rita Hills. Nobody wanted to sell me grapes because they say, you know, we like you, but there, you, we know neither you have money or we have grapes. So uh, somehow I uh, got on the phone and I called uh, uh, oh, I called Fiddlesticks, you know, and, and uh, I talked to Kathy Joseph, and I said, Kathy, could you sell me some grapes? I only need like two tons. And then I said, and by the way, could I pay you with a credit card? And then there was a long silence and a huge burst of laughter. And, and <laughs> Kat was just laughing at me and I started laughing too. And he, she said, you know, I've been doing this for 25 years. She said, 
nobody has ever asked me to pay for grapes with credit card <laughs> from you i'll take the credit card and that's how i that's how i got hold of my first parcel of fiddlesticks pinot noir uh, you know through kathy joseph and and i'm very grateful for it and this is this is a big chunk of of history so maybe not all that well but yeah before we introduce the wine or the first wine Tyler, were you working with Kathy at that time? What years were you working with Kathy? When was, Paul, when was that? Uh, my, yeah, my first vintage was 2006, exactly. Uh, no, I, I finished up, man. I, it is a fun segue, though, because I, so I was uh, at UC Davis studying winemaking, and Kathy's uh, business office is there because her husband's a partner in a law firm in Sacramento. And so, I just like looked, I didn't know, you know, where the wineries necessarily, were. I knew somewhere, yeah, I knew Napa, Sonoma, these things. So I just looked in the phone book, wineries in Davis. I figured there had to be a couple. And she was the only one that seemed legitimate. And I was like, hey, do you mind? Like, I'll just work part time. I just want to, you know, get under somebody's wing while I'm studying. So I kind of have one foot in the industry and I'm not just so jaded by academics. And so Kathy took me in and I worked mostly out of the business office and then a full harvest in 03. Uh, so a little bit in 2002 and then so i was with it for about two years but i i wrapped up uh when i uh i started writing my thesis of spring of 04. Uh, okay. but i'm very familiar with fiddlesticks and you know my way into santa rita hills is is through fiddlesticks as well oddly enough yeah good good combo there of you guys yeah. um and so paul tell us uh tell us about this wine the say la vie from your 2018 drum canyon vineyard pinot noir that's the first wine we're drinking. Uh, this is always hard to do because the thing's not mirrored. There we go. No, there we go. Sure. Anyway, oh, so, so uh, gonna... and then also, and and Paul, uh, Paul will explain things kind of in a romantic way, and then Tyler can deliver the the science behind all this stuff when we try his wine too, because he gets oh, very no, no, no. dialed in. <laughs> that, you can do both. Exactly what I was hoping for. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, Paul. Let tell us about the wine. So, so Celavi Drum Canyon is our first wine that we're tasting, and Zotovich will be the second. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if you know. Normally, I would put them in a different position, but you know, when I taste the wine today, um, I don't know what it is. You know, I I do believe in biodynamics. I those vineyards are not biodynamic. However, I, there, there there is certain you know changes to how the wine tastes throughout the day or throughout the week and the month. And it's interesting because those wines are more similar today on in my glasses here than on uh, than normally, uh, and we can do it that way as well. That's not a problem. So right. uh, normally, uh, normally the Drum Canyon for me is more muscular wine, and uh, it has uh, uh, more mid palate uh, as far as the structure and the tannin, uh, bigger length, and also needs the more time to open up in the glass, in the bottle. And uh, uh, I think it also will be aging longer than Zotovich. Uh, the soil composition is very different in both vineyards. Uh, I can easily explain the soil composition at Zotovich. It's like a fine beach sand. Mm -hmm. And if you want to know the soil composition of Drum Canyon, please ask my colleagues. That's why he is here. <laughs> because he has all the science. The moment this guy starts talking in the vineyard, I feel so small. I said, you know, I don't know anything about anything. So, so, Not so true. You know, if you want to go geology for me uh, or uh, science, soil science, I'm going to say, I'm sorry, I give up. But uh, definitely the soils here are, are, are heavier, denser. And normally, on normal day, those vineyards are are, are are very different. Even though they are probably you know less than two miles apart, you say yeah. uh, the exposure to the sun is different. Zotto, which is a very uh, almost flat vineyard with sl slight northern exposure, and and the two blocks that I have, and you know, Drum Canyon is quite variable, uh, but the ones I have are on a gentle hill, gentle hill one block, which we now change to another one, but the gentle hill, the first one, and then much steeper, uh, steeper hill uh, for the other clone. Uh, and and I Paul, how many, how many Pinots do you make overall in every vintage or on average? You know, I, I don't know anymore. 
<laughs> like a dozen? Well, according, like that? according to my CPA and my 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 brand manager, way too many. But I, you know, <laughs> oh, I own I, this, this I own so brand, so I can do so what I want to do. No, but 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 seriously, seriously, I think I would say seven, seven or eight single vineyards, uh, and uh, one blend, uh, one high-end blend, and one restaurant blend or two restaurant blends. And every, every so often, we would go as far as declassify the vineyard entirely, and then it reduces this uh, by one. And then usually, I try to sneak in two the next year. That nobody notices, but. Uh, <laughs> and when did when did you first start working with Drum Canyon? Uh, you know that is a great question. Let's see here. Um, but, 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 but that was. Fourteen. You, know, you know what I? For, Fourteen would make sense. Uh, your your brand, one of your brand manager, I believe, was moving from you guys to Melville. Yeah, I hope, right. I hope that's not the secret. So because I no, still. No, no. I still dealt with him, and then I was very happy to know that you are there, and then you took over. So right. 14 or 15 for sure. 14, 14 makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. You know, we, at, at first, we actually the name of the original wine was Contender because it was very masculine, masculine and full of tannin, and youth, youthful exuberance. And I, it, the wine reminded me of of Marlon Brando in his youth when he was. You know, which he was m m muscular, but he was also smart and beautiful at the time. Uh, and that's how I named the wine. And, but someone owns this small Syrah vineyard in Washington that we didn't know about, and we had to change the name. <laughs> I'm surprised no one has Say La Vie. Uh, unfortunately, uh, 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 we are in the process of changing this also because there is a French uh, company from Burgundy that has a Seventeen dollar uh, Chardonnay, and they are afraid that it might we get confused. So we we have to check. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how much? How much is this one? Uh, the, pr money? the price. Yeah. Uh, it sells for seventy five dollar uh, a bottle, and is worth absolutely every penny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Tyler, pick up uh, pick up on Drum Canyon uh, where Paul left off. I mean. Tell us, I, some people might not even know where it is, so I guess give us kind of a placement of it uh, in the Santa Rita Hills, and uh, tell us when you started working with it, because the family, I believe, owned the vineyard by the time you were with the brand, right? That's correct, yeah. I just want to give a quick shout out to Michael Larner. I saw him say hello, and Ted said go cards, so I'd be remiss not to say go cards. Uh, yeah, um, I came down in 13, the Deerbergs, I think bought the property in 04 or 05 and planted right away, uh, well, Planted rootstock the next year. I think the first crop was 09, 2010. So I, 13 would have been the fourth or fifth leaf. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the Deerbergs, you know, I mean, just for people who don't know, they're, as far as we both can figure, they're the only family that owns vineyards in the Santa Rita Hills, Santa Maria Valley, and Happy Canyon. So they own vineyards in three distinct appellations of uh, Santa Barbara County, which is a kind of a cool distinction, I think. So you came yeah. in and got a really like, deep look at what was happening here in the county. So tell us when you when you came in and what that was like and, and what you found at Drum Canyon and, and everywhere else. Well, it was definitely an attraction to joining the Deerberg family. So having had my introduction to Santa Barbara through Kathy Joseph, um, when I got introduced to the Deerbergs, you know, it wasn't, Santa Barbara was, was a place that my wife and I had considered, you know, long-term it'd be a great place to land. Um, to be frank, it was a little out of sight, out of mind for people on the North Coast. We're all a little myopic. So, um, you know, if I did a blind taste, I went to a, my tasting group and brought a, somebody brought a Santa Barbara County Pinot, uh, it was probably me. And so when I met the Deerbergs, you know, that opportunity of working in three AVAs, but also working with the state fruit was really appealing because I always romanticized winemaking and being someone like Paul, where you know, you're this humble, humble, uh, you know, <laughs> Polish guy from Canada that's, that's, you know, like pulling himself up by his bootstraps and making wine and making great wine and, and, you know, being like really successful at doing it. You've done a great job, Paul. And 
Uh, but I always saw everybody as like this small kind of grower winemaker. And uh, it's really hard to have that opportunity. I think Paul's done an amazing job, but it's not easy, as he said. And, and so in Sonoma, in Napa, I got to work with a lot of different vineyards. And so it was appealing to get to have perspective on a vintage or, you know, work with Syrah from eight different places or Pinot from five different places. Um, but I always wanted to work with the same vines over and over and over again. And when you only work on three, five-year contracts at most for a long-term deal, um, it's hard as a, my background is in plant physiology and it's hard to really feel like and you mentioned my science, you know, one vintage is one replication and any good science needs several replications. So you get five, seven, eight years in, you start to understand something because that's only eight replications. Um, so it's, it was really appealing to work with, still get to work with different areas, but also work with the state fruit. And, and how did uh, Drum Canyon stand out to you from those, from those three? I mean, you have, you have a Santa Maria uh, vineyard that's, one way of which is but still Pinot and Chardonnay, so it's a kind of a direct comparison there. And then yeah. Happy Canyon is obviously your mostly your Bordeaux stuff. But right. how did where does where does Drum Canyon fit in that portfolio for you guys? And by the way, we should be introducing this wine too, which is the 2017 uh, Deerberg Drum Canyon Vineyard um, from Santa Rita Hills. So where does where does this fit in your scheme of things, basically? Well, I I actually completely agree with Paul's uh, description of it being a little bit more muscular and masculine. This 17 vintage is, is maybe not the best example of that. Uh, frankly, in my uh, seven, now eight vintages here, this is probably the most feminine of those vintages, but it does typically, like, I always would compare it to Santa, our Santa Maria vineyard, uh, which always seems broader and a little bit rounder and softer. And Drum Canyon with its, sort of thicker skins and I don't know if that's the wind plus the soil um, just had a little bit more muscle like Paul said age is, I think what is set up to age better it's at once fresh but also tense with tannin and I do wonder if the fact that we don't have a sandy soils except for the very very top of the vineyard there and the very toe of the vineyard uh, near 246 um, unlike a lot of vineyards on the 246 corridor, which do have a lot of sand, like Zodovich, um, we're more loamy with white shirt, almost like the Santa Rosa Road corridor, which tend to also make more muscular wines. And so I thought Paul's contrast between his two wines were was is really a, a, the way I understand Drum Canyon, too. And if you want me, I don't want to get that geeky about it. I mean, it, people... Well. Are, they overplay my science, you know, like I, my, the favorite wines that I uh, enjoy making the most are the ones I do the least amount to because we understand what's going on. And, but I will say that I do think that the winds of Santa Rita Hills, I think are one of its main differentiating propositions in addition to the soils, but, but uh, the wind, like when I, I always, like I said, compare it to Santa Maria, um, Santa Maria is windy from like the spring through midsummer, but during the ripening period, it really isn't that windy there. It's just really foggy. In the Santa Rita Hills, it's, it's windy all year round. And I think that's why the skins are thicker. That's a typical plant reaction to wind. We see much shorter shoots and short internodes because the plant's like, I need thickness and sturdiness, not length, you know, because it's getting battered by that wind. And that probably contributes to some of that muscle that Paul was talking about. It's just... When, when I see the Santa Rita Hills go across the sorting table, it's like marbles, you know, it's like turgid type berries. Santa Maria Valley, which I love, but it's like soup. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> kind of mushy and it's prone to mold. And, um, you know, it, it, it's so I personally, I, I personally lean to Santa Rita Hills, frankly. And you're, I mean, weren't you a, like a plant scientist before you got into wine? Wasn't that your first? Yeah. Yeah. So I used to refer to myself when I was working at High Develin Winery in Napa, I used to refer to myself as an overqualified tank cleaner because I had two masters of science degrees, one in botany where I studied plant molecular biology and then one in, one in uh, uh, viticulture and analogy and nobody cared. I just needed to pressure wash the floors. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. buddy, just keep washing. <laughs> yeah, Stefan Vivier, who was, you know, before, uh, after Kathy Joseph, one of my early mentors, and Aubert de Blen, you know, like they, 
uh, I'll never forget the first time I was topping barrels at HDV and I'd been there maybe two weeks. It was ahead of the 2004 harvest. And Stefan Vivi, if you don't know, he's a great guy. He, I, I refer to him as being French in all the good ways and not French in all the good ways. It's like he was a perfect mix. And so I go and I'm topping these barrels and he checks my, my topping. And I hadn't, well, he liked to top it into the bung hole. And then when you put the bung on that the wine would spill out. And I topped it just to the bottom of the bung hole because I didn't want to spill. Yeah. And uh, he opens up one of the barrels and he says, is this the way they teach you to top at UC Davis? Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You know, and he just kind of put me in my place right away. And I think that, that um, you know, you can have all the science in the world and make uh, really average wines. Uh, you know, you have to have some sense of inspiration, some sense of the aesthetics of wine. And I think you learn that by drinking the world's, you know, the wines of the world, like, like Paul did. Um, you know, and that's why we enjoy working with people like Paul because, um, you know, there's a bar that has to be high and we have that for ourselves. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's more fun to have clients that have a similar bar because they, we don't always see things the same way, but it's an opportunity to learn, you know, maybe there's a different way to do things. Right. And uh, you can get a little geeky here. How, how do you um, compare to Santa Maria? And Paul can answer this as well after you do. But Tyler, when you're processing the, the Santa Rita Hills fruit, how is it different than how you do the Santa Maria Valley fruit? Well, we, de we have to, we have to, we usually have to sort Santa Maria much more thoroughly because it's prone to botrytis. Uh, first of all, it, Oddly, the, the chemistries are often similar. So the potential alcohol, the acidity, the pH, all come in, you know, very favorable for our numbers. We make no adjustments whatsoever. Um, we will use a little more stem inclusion in the Drum Canyon because for whatever reason, it is able to incorporate that aromatically without it turning into green bean. And I like the added structure. I want more structure in the Santa Maria, but if we put too many too much stems in, it, it quickly turns to like canned green bean aromatics, which as much as I like stems and have used them for over a decade, I do not like a stemmy wine that, that smells that way. Um, all, they're all fermented uh, without inoculating. You know, we just wait on them. Usually the, the maceration time is much longer on Santa Maria because I'm trying to get more structure and more tannin out of it. Where in, like I said, it tends to be softer and I kind of want more structure. Drum, we have to be careful. You know, when we put the stems in, um, 14, 16 days is often plenty, depending on the vintage. Uh, we rarely go to three weeks, whereas we're with Santa Maria, we're routinely three to four week macerations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Paul, uh, let's introduce this wine and then give us your breakdown. You also work with more vineyards in Santa Maria than, than, than uh, Tyler probably does. So you might have a slightly different perspective, but we're going to try this as we talk about that. This is the uh, Paul Otto Zotovich Vineyard Pinot Noir, which he calls Sea Biscuit. So tell us about this wine, Paul, and tell us about how you process Santa Rita versus Santa Maria differently, if at all. Sure. So let's let's we're gonna let us go to Sibiscus first. Okay. I'm gonna have a I'm gonna have a sip to refresh my memory. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think you are right. That's this stylistically this probably would have gone before. No, no, no. So ten minutes ago when I opened the wines were open for one hour at the winery, but the cork was not pulled out, or whatever. They were pretty tight or reticent at this moment. Now they are going, all of all four wines have transformed for me. You know, and, and I tell you, when I was a sommelier, I was so geeky about uh, decant this, what do you put, do you put with this one? Maybe this one, it doesn't work. <clears throat> and then I became this, you know, total winemaker. It's like, hey man, it's all good. It's all good. I just became California. It's all good. You know, I just go, boom, you know. There. And now... <laughs> that's that's one of your proprietary names too. It's all good on one of your wines as well. Yeah, right? that's, that's correct too. That was from my Zen teacher, but we'll talk about this another day. Yeah. But now, <laughs> and now, and now, I'm I'm really I'm working on this, on this, and, and it is important, you know, on this uh, integration of my 
sommelier background and the winemaker's background where we don't need to be geeky, we don't need to go over the top, we don't need to go, so oh, monsieur, you don't understand this, you know. Um, uh, at the same time, I, 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 last year in London, I, I was throwing my wines and it was, you know, 30 some degrees Celsius, way too warm. And I went to a great restaurant and they were, and we were in the Somali headquarters and everybody was sweating like pigs. The wines were too warm. And I, I, I pointed out to the sommelier that those wines are too warm. And they said, don't worry, we are so smart. We can assess it at any temperature. Well, he's not, <laughs> he's not, my, he's not my favorite friend anymore. But, but, but he was Polish, by the way, you know, one of the masters. I, I'll shut up right now. Maybe he watching this. I like you, buddy. Anyway, so uh, going back to, to, to be serious now. Uh, Zorovic, very different now. We can see this in the glass. Those who are tasting this right now, if you open it early with aeration now, we do have the, the texture changed, the perception of tannin change. Zorovic, much smoother. <coughs> Excuse me. As a matter of fact, on, on, on a good day of Zorovic, you can confuse it for a really, really good Santa Maria Pinot Noir because it will have a very soft texture and great aromatics. And this is why I make Zotovich and I make Drum Canyon because those two wines are very different. Mm. And I think with a little bit of aeration now, we can see them. And of course, this is both are from 2018 vintage, which is great, but they are very young. So uh, I think the differences will, will sh for next few years, the differences will show more and more. Uh, so now going back to uh, Santa Maria versus Santa Rita Hills. Uh, to me, Santa Maria uh, vineyards uh, uh, are all about great aromatics, if things go well, of course, great aromatics, strawberry-like, raspberry, very fresh, and silky textures. And and I think what I'm trying to do is to, for, for, for number one, not to lose aromatics and, and make sure the wine has wonderful texture. And then if I'm if I'm lucky and I'm smart enough and the vintage is right, I'll try to add a little bit more structure. And Santa Rita Hills, I work exactly from the opposite angle. The wines usually will be much much larger, much bigger. They will have a sturdy structure. But if I make a mistake, I might lose the aromatics, and they will be too, you know, too. They can be easily too harsh, and as the French would say, over extracted. So uh, Santa Rita Hills for me, this is the power. I call it, you know, this is my uh, romantic or European understanding of wine. Santa Rita Hills, I see more like James Bond. You have the muscle, you just have to send him to a good school that he went and and beautiful suit and, and the muscle is always there, but you, you try to make him, you know, with polite manners, but the punch is always there. With Santa Maria, you have a pretty girl and with a beautiful dress, just make sure that that she smells good and and uh, behaves properly and have fun. So, so very, very different, very different perspective. Yeah, that's we a good point. Yeah, go ahead, Tyler. I don't. You want to build on the James Bond versus uh, sexy well, lady? <laughs> well, well, I do think it's a good analogy, and you know, I think that uh, Paul's been in this area longer than me, and I think in 2015, I learned that lesson about Santa Rita Hills's punch um you know the difficult way because that was such a unique vintage where the the wines were not only like concentrated which usually is a good thing but for pinot i mean these these wines were like adolescent and punching you in the face and i think i i was actually a little too exuberant about that i thought wow this is amazing and, and there's the shortest maceration we still tried to press them early and, and do things but i don't think i anticipated um like longer term as it was in bottle how that the risk of imbalance there like my my supreme focus in our wines is is sort of an impeccable balance and i thought during harvest you know i was pairing this sort of muscle and concentration of 15 which really stands out to me as a you know unique vintage in my career um uh really you know i thought i was doing a good job and when i taste those wines now I find myself not only thinking they need more time, and I think that's true, 
But I see Paul's point where I think we lost something about the aromatics and the, the wines show in bigness. It, it um, almost diminishes the, the true character of Santa Rita, uh, Santa Rita Hills. Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't want to sit here and talk poorly about our wines. I mean, I love the wine, but like mm -hmm. the 14 we're going to taste had a lot more prettiness, but that punch is still there. It's the it's got the suit and the tux and he's playing cards and he's about to kick your butt, you know, like he can do that if he wants to, but he's got manners. <laughs> okay. Hangs out with the queen on a good day, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if, I, if I can, if I can throw in few few things here, absolutely. I think it's very, very, very uh, honest and daring of you to, you know, say a few things about the 15 vintage, as you said, and I and I totally agree. And I remember I had this conversation with a couple of wine, or specifically one wine critic, and he told that the 15 was the the blessing and the greatest vintage ever. And I said, it's a good vintage. Uh, however, remember this was the last vintage, If I'm and correct me if I'm wrong, last vintage of the drought, right? Because uh, 16 got the rain, right? And yeah. on the 15, 15, the vines were very stressed out from from whatever, two, three, four years of, of drought. And uh, uh, and it was also low low yielding vintage. So you had, you had, uh, a dry uh, kind of a dryness of that extract from um, from drought and then you had very little very low yields so it was one on the other it was all about power and where is the finesse and where is the aromatics so uh, uh, i agree that there are some beautiful wines made in 15 but it was not the easiest you know not the easiest not every single wine work out that way you know i'm a big fan of you know, 17, 18 for sure, 19, uh, uh, the late post, uh, post, uh, uh, you know, when we had enough rain, post drought, there were easier vintages. I think hopefully most people make made uh, beautiful wines because because they were there. Um, but anyway, um, How, how's the, uh, how's 2020 looking for you? I mean, it's, you're almost about to pick some of the stuff now. I know Tyler, you're already picking some of your stuff, but I've been hearing good things. I know there's a bunch of concern about smoke tain in some of the northern regions um but what about around here i mean things are looking pretty good I, either I, of you can take that but yeah yeah, i think so uh i was uh it, we've been, we were trending warmer since the spring but then july and august i mean were just so cool and so beautiful for the vines and you know we had just enough rain that late we you know had five and a half inches of rain almost in march in the first two weeks of march that was a godsend. I mean, just to get recharge those soils uh, with some spring rain. Uh, th this recent heat was a real challenge, but um, it came at the correct time. You know, if you're at 20, 20% sugar, 20 bricks, um, the vines still have a pretty good connection with leaves and with water to, to resist the dehydration pressure that that heat's gonna put on the vines, which would force you to, you know, do I need to pick, do I not need to pick? And we faced that in 17 a little bit with Pinot, which which made it challenging, but um, our stuff has sustained that heat pretty well. And so now I guess it still remains to be seen, but I'm really excited. I, ha I just have this, this anti-pandemic sense that 2020, is gonna be amazing. And I'm telling myself, and I'm telling anybody that will listen to me, that we have an obligation as winemakers to knock it out of the freaking park this year because people need hope and they need great wine to give them hope. And that's what we're gonna deliver. And so like heat spells be damned. I've been up since three this morning and our press broke and we had all these problems. And Jeff, our associate winemaker, I told him it is, I am so happy for your attitude you, you just like owned this press breaking and it was like, it's such a cheerful day. I got here, you know, the stars were amazing. There's so much wonder in the world. And I was like, screw the pandemic. We're going to make amazing wine in 2020 is going to be amazing. Now I say that knowing there might be people watching the North coast who are dealing with smoke taint. And I really am sorry about that because 2020 with smoke taint is not going to be amazing for you. We're not dealing with that issue down here, thank, thank God. But um, 
honestly, I think our 18 and 19s, I'm so pleased with them. You know, Paul's wine, I think, show 18. I mean, like I said, I thought I thought I was like I, I used to say to people about 15, if you could fall out of bed and make good wine at 15. And I realized in hindsight that was wrong. It was more difficult than I realized, and that was my mistake. Um, and 18 and 19 were so beautiful, and I really think 20 is set up to follow that. And so, well, yeah. hopefully, it will. yeah, I've been very excited by the 2017. To me, was actually a vintage that, depending on the the winery, was was not as good as some past vintages, which was the first time I've really seen that. Um, uh, in doing this, the wine enthusiast job that I do, which I've been doing since 2014. It was the first vintage where a lot of people made perfectly good, if not great wines, but there were some that I usually really liked that I just kind of liked a good amount. I wasn't like blown away. And then 18s have been kind of knocking my socks off uh, across the board, including these wines by Paul today. So, um, I, I, Matt, I agree with you. And I think that for us, you know, again, the perspective of three ABAs, the, the coastal vineyard 17 was way more challenging Happy Canyon, like, well, I'm really right. stoked about those wines. But the the Pinot and the Chard, it was tough with the heat that came. But Labor Day, crazy. Yeah, and it was higher potential alcohols. It's not like the heat I was just talking about where the potential alcohols were lower and the vines could sustain it. It yeah. was, are they going to sustain it? And it really forced people to say, like, should I pick, should I not pick? Um, right. So it was a little tougher. Well, Tyler, let's let's talk about your last wine that, you're, that we're pouring here, and our last wine of the of the evening, which is uh, the Deerberg Drum Canyon Vineyard Thai, which is one of your your top uh, your kind of luxury level bottling. So, explain the development of that program. Um, we can yeah. talk a little about ageability, and then we can then we can finish with Paul talking about his thoughts on Santa Rita Hills uh, aging potential. Sure. So, Thai is named after the there's. We have two top tier uh, uh, Pinot Noirs, Stephen and Ty. They're both the oldest grandchildren of Jim and Mary Deerberg, the founders. And when I, you know, so I'm going to tell us, hopefully, I don't know if the Deerbergs are watching, but I'm, yeah, I've been here eight vintages over seven years. There's, there's no pretense anymore. Uh, when I came on board, I tasted everything out of barrel with Jeff, and we had two weeks of tasting, lots of verticals. And they had made a wine called Stephen for uh, a, a couple of vintages, not every vintage. And it was supposed to be their top tier wine. And we got to this barrel where they said, well, so this is this is a barrel designated for Stephen. And so Jeff and I, you know, I kind of took over and he's thinking, who is this guy? He's coming from Sonoma, Napa. Like, you know, can I trust him? And I'm thinking, like, who is this guy? You know, it's almost harvest and I need a good leader in the cellar. And. Uh, I'll say for the record, Jeff is still here, and we have a great uh, rapport. And what's, so, what's Jeff's last name? Jeff Connick. He's a local local guy. Uh, worked for Rick Longoria for a while. Okay, great. And um, you know, it's just he's the guy I referenced earlier with his attitude being so great. To, he anchors the seller's calm. And uh, anyway, we get to this barrel, and he says, "You know, this is designated for Stephen. This is 2012 vintage." And I finally said. I'm sorry, this wine personally offends me. Like this is not Pinot Noir. You know, this is picked at 30 bricks. It, it you know, it's 17% of potential alcohol, water. I mean, it just was not Pinot Noir. So I made a lot of Syrah in my career in Sonoma and it was, it was bigger than a Syrah. And so I approached the Deerbergs and I said, look, I understand you want to have an elevated wine. And I think you have the vineyards that could produce an elevated wine like that. Like Paul said, it's his, his, his uh, drum canyon is worth every penny. But let's let the vineyard tell us where that wine is. Let's not manufacture the wine by the way that we call our pick or the oak that we use or what have you. And sure I'm enough. I'm having another sip. This is delicious. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Paul. And so my, my goal was to start. We, we, we kept everything separate, every single block separate. And 13 and 14, we, we, had, we weren't selling as much fruit. We had more fruit coming in. And so I really got to study the vineyards. You know, the whole goal of our winery is to understand the vineyard. And sure enough, this one block, which is the one we picked yesterday, just emerged as having all of these extra layers, all this extra depth. And the real cue to me, I, I found that uh, particularly good fruit absorbs and integrates new oak in a way that improves the wine without showing off the oak. 
And so we were tasting the new, we were studying our new barrels in the 13 and 14 vintage and the wine from this block, like just the oak just disappeared. And it just was a cue that maybe something's going on. So with the 2014 vintage, this was the inaugural vintage of this wine. And we have a counterpart, Stephen, from Santa Maria, where it's now a single block wine. It's derived from a specific soil type, specific part of the vineyard. And this wine's all, you know, 100% new oak. Um, and, you know, and it's just integrated into the wine. And it's fun. I haven't tasted this in a while. It's fun to taste. the. Four, we only made 40 cases. And, um, you know, it, it, it seems youthful to me still. And to Paul's point earlier about Santa Rita Hills' sort of impression it gives that it can age, I think this wine shows, you know, shows that potential. It's still young so, and it's seven so years. So beautiful wine. Thank you, Paul. And uh, Tyler, what did you what do you charge for the tie? In the uh, 95. Okay. And what was your other one? The just the basic uh, Drum Canyon vineyard? It's 52, and they're both worth every penny. <laughs> And Paul, your Zodovich is uh, 75 as well, or? Uh, Zodovich is also 75, yes. And that's that's worth every penny too, right? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what is your, I mean, what's your sense of um, age worthiness in Santa Rita Hills, Paul? You talked about it a little bit already, but what, like, what's a drinking window for you on, on these wines? You know, uh, again, when I was a sommelier, you know, I, I drank quite a bit of old wines. And, and uh, as sommeliers, we also get geeky uh, and uh, um, infatuated with, with, with old wines. Oh, look at this, 20 years old, this 30 year old. And in as a winemaker, you realize that some of those wines are past their primes. They are, they are not evolving. You know, they, they are just... Uh, uh, they are deteriorating on a, at, at its best. They are just changing. They are changing, but not becoming any better. So, uh, as a winemaker, I'm much more careful about about uh, you know aging of wine. Uh, however, I had the saying, you know, Sony gives you a warranty for two years. Polaro gives you the warranty for ten years. So, uh, <laughs> ten years, I give you the warranty for parts, labor, and everything besides cork. Well, I'll, I'll throw in the cork, too. No problem. <laughs> if you don't like it, I will replace it. Uh, so I'll, I'll buy that car. And, and then you're on your own. Uh, but, but, you know, to be serious, I, I have some vintages of my 07. I don't have 06 anymore, but 07 fiddlesticks that we tasted. And, and, and you know what? It still evolves. It's, it lost that, uh, that edge that it had of the of the iron muscular tannin it was it was not as well balanced as Dirbrick is better balanced for many reasons uh so i i think that you know for santa rita hills 10 years on pinot noir is is no problem the problem is why do you want to keep it that long i said drink the goddamn thing I invite your friends make a party and then i'll sell you more wine you know uh but but, but seriously again Santa Maria can age almost as well as Santa Rita Hills, but the window of drinkability is what opens almost immediately with Santa, Santa Maria, right? With Santa Rita Hills, especially, you know, Deerbrook. Santa Rita Hills could be probably three different appellations, maybe more, but we'll get there eventually. We are so young. It's, a, it's fascinating to be part of it. It's fascinating to, to make those wines and observe those changes. But, you know, the wines on... on uh, 246 versus the ridge where sea smoke is versus over the ridge where uh, pig ranches in uh, well, Santa Rosa Road. And then you could even talk about uh, west versus, versus east, right? You know, we could play this very differently. If we were Burgundy, it would be many sub appellations. Maybe we'll get there one day. Uh, but in general, you know, on, on that sea smoke, Deerbrook, that side here, I think that. The power of those wines with that masculine thing, you know, 10, 15 years is no problem if you are in a great cellar and if you want to do that. And you don't have to do that. You can enjoy those wines much earlier. Uh, but, but if you are worrying about ageability of fine wines, and by the way, those two drum, I mean, Deerberg wines are beautiful. They opened up incredibly well. Taylor, great, great tribute to you for this. Different wines. 
and I don't use any stamps. You obviously use stamps. We both believe in New York with the same philosophy where it should never overpower, it should complement. Uh, so um, there is some similarity and some differences, but I'm a big believer in that vineyard. You guys are absolutely great uh, to work with under your, uh, you know, you know, you being the, the man in charge and we very much appreciate uh, uh, that and, and the and Dilbrook family for for joining, in, you know, letting us join in uh, and and uh, the best is yet to come. I think as the vineyard matures and also your vineyard practices have have accelerated over the last, you know, I don't know, two, three, four, four years. Um, I, I think we're going to be making stunning wines out of there. Absolutely stunning. Great. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think we, we brought all the farming in-house and, you know, if you think yeah. about it, we're only, we're only one generation in, right? Both as, both as, uh, um, you know, the, the vineyard, like you, we're starting to redevelop things. And the reason we ferment everything separate and work with people like Paul who have outside perspective on our own fruit is to say how, when we have to redevelop, which always has to happen, how do we redevelop in a way where we get better? Because we control our vineyard, we control the property, we control the material. We have ways in which we can redevelop to get better. Um, and I, I agree with you completely about the ageability. We had a 2002 Santa Maria you know, from the Deerberg Vineyard uh, last week. That was, that was excellent. But that, um, you know, so that, that's a long time, but I think that drink, like you said, the drinking window opens sooner for those wines than it does for uh, the Santa Rita Hills. And Jim, I just want to say, Matt, to Jim Salvito, yes, there's a lengthy aging plan at the Deerberg cellar. <laughs> yeah, you have 250 cubby holes, right? Yeah, we got a long, we got a lot of wine. We got a lot of wine. To, there's a lot of empty cubbies that I have to fill over the next uh, <laughs> decade or two. <laughs> Great. Great. Well, we've, uh, feels like we could keep talking for another hour, but we got to let people get back to their lives and uh, I got to go make dinner and, and that sort of thing. So um, thank you too for, for joining uh, us uh, with Santa Rita Hills Wine Alliance. A uh, reminder that there's the uh, wine, uh, the Wine Alliance Passport event is September 1st to 15th. Uh, it's for 30 bucks. You get a passport and you're able to visit um, the tasting rooms that are open. Or if you're more interested in tasting at home, there's an option for that too. So um, just check out Santa Rita Hills, uh, S T A R Rita Hills, Star Rita Hills um, dot com uh, for, for details there and, and to get involved with that. Uh, and uh, I'll see you next time on uh, September. 8th with uh, Flying Goat and uh, Sea Grape. And then again, September 22nd with Transcendence and Crawford Family. October 6th with Hitching Post and Pally. And we'll be uh, lining up more uh, into uh, November and December. I actually have a fairly long list of members who want to be part of this. So if any members are watching and want to kind of get uh, on top of that list, feel free to reach out to Barbara at the Santa Rita Hills Wine Alliance and we'll uh, schedule you. So um, thank you too for, for joining me. I hope you guys had a good time. And uh, hey, Matt, good luck with before, before we go, I just want to say, I just remembered, sorry, uh, yeah. Paul, Paul and I, are, we're only going to communicate about, you know, the pick for his fruit, and then we're not going to see each other for three months. So, Paul, if you are willing, next time we have lunch, I really want to have that Fiddlesticks 07. If you have it. Sure, sure. I'll if buy I have, it. I will we... buy it to make sure you're no. whole on it. No but worries. We both entered the Santa Rita Hills through fiddlesticks. We have to have that wine sure. together. Sure. And you know what? We we, we are we are friend, uh, I'm friends with Kathy, and I never forget. Uh, you know that moment. I, I could like make a drawing of why I know where I was standing in my home, my rented room like, at that time, and calling her on the phone and and uh, how how much she laughed about like that stuff. So uh, I'll be I'll be happy to share this with you. Um, for now, Matt, thank you very much. It's great moderating. I think we both appreciate very much. Taylor, uh, uh, thank you much. Thank you for you and for today and also for for the last, you know, whatever, several years that we're cooperating. Great respect to you, beautiful winemaking, and, and the Dearbrook family who have been nothing but uh, super kind to me. And I could not be here without many people 
uh, uh, who extended their kindness and uh, um, it generosity towards me. So I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. The, the only uh, downside, Tyler, is that bottle's four fifty, but it's worth every penny. So Whoa. hey, <laughs> I'll buy it for four fifty. It'll be a great experience. That much it's that free. Guy. It's free for all of you. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> great. Well, thank you guys. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, have a good harvest. And uh, we'll see you soon. Actually, I'll see you in person, Tyler, on Friday. Sounds like yeah, that's right. Look forward to it. That'll be fun. Yeah. That's going to work out. Well, cool guys, listen, Bill. I'm cooking lunch at the winery on Friday. Why don't you two come down my way? <laughs> <laughs>